I'm Brittany, this is Lanjan, and welcome to Gay Watch, where we watch gay things, and sometimes we read them, and we are continuing through Volume 5 of Modao Zushi today. We will be getting back on track, since we had to hop backwards to read Incense Burner last time. We will now be reading the fifth one called The Iron Hook. Have not heard a single thing about this. No idea who it even involves. So this will take up most of our time today, but we will actually get a little bit into side story number six, which is called Lotus Seeds, which makes me think I'm going to get, I'm, just, I'm, I'm emotionally afraid of that one, okay? But we will be getting into a little bit of Lotus Seeds today, but mostly it'll be the Iron Hook. All right. <coughs> I have a cough. It's asthmatic. It's chronic. We do our best to ignore it. I do my best to angle my face away from the mic. Yeah, we know. Um, these are pre-recorded for the you know sake of any possible like a, a smut opportunities that might pop up, but I don't edit these for the live stream uh, vibes, so to speak. So this is just all one shot. It's all one way through. Literally, just accept the fact that I didn't hit go live. This is what this is what happens on these streams, right? So I believe that's it actually. I was silly and accidentally scheduled the incense burner um, section of the reading to go up a day late. So you will, so you will be finishing Moda Zushi volume five on Monday instead of Friday. But that's fine. I'll still be finishing it on Friday, but you're going to have to wait the weekend. It's one of those, I didn't look closely enough at the date. It's I, d my bad, my bad. But other than that, now, I think we're good. I think we're good to start. I don't know. I don't know what to expect. We're back in uncharted territory. <coughs> okay, the Iron Hook. The Bai residence's infamous local reputation could largely be attributed to the White Chamber. As for why it was called the White Chamber, the first reason was naturally because it was white. When it was first built, the walls had been covered with white mortar. The owner had planned to add some color with decorations. Construction went very smoothly in the rest of the, res in the, rest of the residence, but strange things began to happen when it reached the chamber in the western courtyard, leaving them no choice but to shelve their renovation plans. To date, the White Chamber remained incongruous with the rest of the magnificently ornamented by residence. It was such a stark white that it made one's skin crawl. The room is secured with three locks and three bolts. This is dialogue now. No matter how sweltering the summer day might be, its vicinity is as cold as an ice cellar. According to the current master of the Bai family, when his father was a child, there was a day when the ball he was playing with rolled all the way to the room's entrance. When he went to pick it up, he was unable to restrain his curiosity and snuck a peek through the slit in the door. When a straight-faced Jin Ling got to this point in the story, he saw Wei Wuxian, who was standing off to the side, reach his hand into a coffin to peel open the corpse's eyelids. The words that would have followed got caught in Jin Ling's throat, choking him off. Hearing the lull in, in his story, Wei Wuxian turned to look at him, snuck a peek through the slit in the door. The group of Land Clan juniors behind Jin Ling shifted their gazes toward Jin Ling in unison. After a pause, Jin Ling continued, snuck a peek through the slit in the door, then stood there blankly, unable to move even after a long time. When his family found him and dragged him away, he fainted. He was struck with a fever that burned so hot he became delirious and later couldn't remember a thing. From then on, he never dared go near the place again. No one is allowed to leave their room after midnight, and they are not allowed to go near the White Chamber in particular. This is one of the family's unbreakable rules. At a certain time after midnight, they can hear the creaking of the old wooden floorboards inside the chamber, even though there's clearly no one inside. And they can also hear... Jin Ling clenched his hands into fists and made... And ma yeah, sorry, I'm excited. The ducklings are here. Jin Ling clenched his hands into fists and made a murderous gesture. The sound of hemp rope slowly tightening like there's something being strangled to death. Many days ago, a servant of the Bai residence had passed by the White Chamber while doing his morning sweeping. He discovered a small hole the size of a finger poked in the thin paper window of the White Chamber's wooden door. 
and a man had been prone on the ground at its entrance. He was a stranger, unknown to anyone from the residence. He was about 40 years old, veins bulging on his ashen face and fingers clutching at his chest. He was long dead. The servant had been terrified, as was the master of the house. After much deliberation, the authorities had concluded that he was an unlucky night burglar who just happened to barge, of all places, into the forbidden area of the by residence. It was there he had seen something that triggered a heart attack, causing him to die of fright right then and there. And for what that something was, they had torn, they had torn down all the locks and paper seals in the white chamber in their investigation, only to remain baffled. But now that someone had died, the master of the Bai family knew they could no longer pretend there was nothing in the white chamber. If this evil was not eradicated, there would be no end to the trouble it would cause them in the future. So he had gritted his teeth, plucked up his courage, and traveled to Golden Carp Tower, where he presented a huge sum of money to implore the Jin Clan of Lanling to call on his house for a night hunt. That concluded the backstory of this incident. Lan Jing Yi was on the verge of a breakdown as he held up the coffin lid and said despairingly, Wei Chimbe, are you done? This person's been dead for so many days, even a walking corpse doesn't stink this bad. Lan Shijui, who was helping him hold the lid open, hovered between laughter and tears. The coffin is simple and crude, and this rundown charitable mortuary is exposed to the elements with no one to care for it. It's inevitable, given the coffin has been here for a few days. Hang in there a bit longer, we still need to take notes. Jin Ling humphed. It's more than enough to give a burglar a proper burial. Don't tell me we should worship him like he's the Buddha. After prodding the corpse for half a day, Wei Wuxian finally lifted his face out of the coffin. He took off his gloves and, and tossed them away. Have you all had a look? Yes. Good. In that case, what's our next step? Wei Wuxian asked. Summon his soul, answered Lan Jing Yi. Duh, Jin Ling scoffed. I've already tried that. And? Wei Wuxian probed. He's not powerfully obsessed with anything, and his soul's too weak. What's more, he was frightened to death. More than seven days have passed since he died, so his soul is completely dissipated. There's no way to summon it back, Jin Ling answered. An attempt like that is no different from not attempting at all, Lan Jing Yi lamented. Then let's go take a look at the white chamber, Lan Shijui quickly cut in. Let's go, let's go, Jin Gong Ji, please, please lead the way. As he spoke, he pushed Lan Jing Yi out of the door, successfully nipping a new round of meaningless arguments in the bud. The group of boys strode across the threshold, several of them jumping over it, their steps brisk and spry. Although Jin Ling was supposed to lead the way, he trailed behind them. Have there been any residents have there been any instances of unnatural deaths or unsolved cases in the Bai residence before? Lan Shijui asked Jin Ling. The master of the family insists there are none, Jin Ling answered. The few elders who have passed did so naturally, of old age. There are no conflicts among the household's members either. Oh no, Lan Jing Yi said. I have a bad feeling about this. Usually when someone says that, there's definitely some kind of conflict. They're just covering it up. In any case, I've repeatedly confirmed it with them, Jin Ling said. But nothing came of questioning them, and there was nothing unusual about what I turned up. You can try again, though. As he had already done his homework beforehand and repeatedly investigated the White Chamber, he did not enter the Bai residence with with them this time. Instead, he found a roadside tea stall outside and took a seat. A black shadow drifted over not long later. Wei Wuxian sat across from him. Jin Ling. Two dashing characters sitting at the same tiny tea stall were indeed a tad conspicuous, so much so that the woman serving tea kept looking back despite how busy she was. This was the first time Wei Wuxian had seen Jin Ling... Jing Lin, sorry... Ooh, wait. I wonder, is that a typo? Instead of Jin Ling, it says Jing Lin. So I was like, wait, was there like another, did another person come? I think that may have been a typo. But that's not, uh, what, no, 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 yeah. I had seen Jin Ling face to face after they had parted at the Guanyin Temple, and he had only now managed to get a chance to speak to him alone. Jin Ling paused for a moment, his expression unreadable. What? How are you doing at Golden Carp Tower nowadays? Wei Wuxian asked. Same old, Jin Ling answered. As it happened, there had been many twists and turns on the journey that the master of the Bai family had taken to request Golden Carp Tower initiate to hunt. To request Golden Carp Tower initiate a hunt. 
Had it been a few years earlier, when the Jin clan of Lan Lang was at the peak of their power, like the sun at high noon, even offering ten times as large a reward might not have made it possible for him to request the assistance of a scion of the Jin clan of Lan Lang. In fact, a common merchant household like the Bai, wealthy but lacking in power and prestige, could never have called on the Jins for even a social visit, let alone pled with, pled with them to hunt down some evil creature. But the cultivation world was no longer what it used to be. Although the common folks didn't know the details of this dramatic change, they had heard some vague rumors, and that was what encouraged the master of the Bai family to give it a try. He had approached the main gate with some trepidation, presented his name card. Oh, there's a footnote about the name card. A visitation card, a paper or wooden badge that indicates a person's name, position, and so on. They were commonly used by officials, nobles, or other distinguished people to notify another party of their visit. Calling cards. Gotcha. Victorian calling cards is what I'm comparing them to. Um, presented his name card and explained his intentions. The guard had taken his bribe and reluctantly left to report his arrival. When he returned, however, he was suddenly hostile, claiming the head of the family had turned down the request. He moved to drive the Bai family head He moved to drive the Bai family head away. The Bai family head, who had never really expected to secure the Jin clan's help, was fine with leaving. However, he grew annoyed with the guard for being so nasty to him after accepting his bribe and demanded his money back. As they argued back and forth, a handsome young man wearing a sparks amid snow uniform emerged from the vermilion doors with bow in hand. Seeing this unbecoming scene, he instantly frowned and asked about the situation. The guard had started stammering. The master of the Bai family observed that despite being but a child, this young man was likely of quite high status. He hurriedly told him everything. To his surprise, the moment the young man heard his story, he flew into a rage and sent the guard rolling down Golden Carp Tower steps with a strike of his palm. That usually doesn't result in anything great. Pushing people down steps. Especially those steps. <laughs> the head of the family said to drive him away, the young man yelled. Why didn't I hear anything about that? He had then turned to the master of the Bai family and said, You're from the Bai family? The ones who live ten, kilo ten kilometers west of the city. I got it. Go back now. Someone will go find you in a few days. The master of the Bai family returned home in utter bewilderment. A group of juniors from prominent cultivation clans had indeed arrived at his door a few days later, but he had no idea that one of the young men was, in fact, the head of the Jing clan of Lan Lang himself. <coughs> Oof. Of course, he couldn't have known that the Jin clan of Lan Ling was currently in a state of total disarray. The guard hadn't reported to Jin Ling, who was the real head of the family. Instead, he had gone to inform the elder of the Jin clan of Lan Ling. When that elder heard even the most common of merchants now dared set foot on the Jin clan of Lan Ling's golden steps, he had promptly flown into a rage and ordered the guard to throw the man out. Who would have thought that he would run into Jin Ling on his way to the hunting grounds by complete coincidence? Jin Ling knew all the clan elders put on airs, priding themselves on being a prominent clan with a century of history. They refused to lower themselves, no matter what, and refused to give audience to anyone who wasn't distinguished or eminent. Jin Ling had always detested such behavior. He was furious with the guard for treating him like a nobody and going over his head to report to someone else and it also occurred to him that no disciples or guest cultivators would have dared accept bribes while Jin Guang Yao was still alive. The more he dwelled on it, the angrier he became. It just so happened that he had made plans with Lan Chijui, Lan Jingyi, and the others to go on a series of night hunts that month, and so they made a trip to the Bai residence together. If he was honest with himself, Wei Wuxian's presence wasn't a complete surprise. Jin Ling might not have been willing to tell others of his struggles, but many eyes were watching Golden Carp Tower, and many mouths had nothing better to do than gossip. News had long since spread to Wei Wuxian and Lan Wangji. Wei Wuxian knew Jin Ling wasn't willing to show weakness, so he said, Go to your uncle more often if something's wrong. It's not like he's Jin, Jin Ling answered coldly. Wei Wuxian was taken aback when he heard this, but then understanding hit him. Caught between laughter and tears, for the second time in this story, he raised a hand and smacked Jin Ling on the back of the head. Talk sense! Jin Ling let loose an ow! His forced composure finally cracked. 
The slap might not have hurt, but he felt as if he had suffered a great humiliation, which deepened even further when he heard the girlish giggle of the woman serving tea at the side. Covering his head, he hollered, Why did you hit me? I hit you to remind you to think of your uncle, Wei Wuxian said. He's not a busybody who likes meddling in other people's affairs, but for your sake, he goes to other people's houses to throw his weight around. In turn, he gets fingers pointed at him, and you write him off as not a jinn. Surely he'd be bitterly, bitterly disappointed to hear that. Jinling was stunned for a moment, then began to rage. I didn't mean it that way. I. Then what did you mean? Wei Wuxian replied. I, Jinling said, uh... The first eye was full of bluster, while the second eye was deflated. I, I, I will help you say what you mean, Wei Wuxian said. Jing Chung may be your uncle, but he's still an outsider to the Jin clan of Lan Ling. He's already intervened a few times to help you, but if he continues to overstep his authority in other people's domains, it will become an excuse for others to denounce him in the future, which will cause him trouble. Am I right? Jin Ling fumed. Duh, so you do understand. Then why did you hit me? Wei Wuxian backhandedly smacked him again. That is why I'm hitting you. Can't you just come out with whatever you have to say? How does such a nice sentiment sound so offensive when it comes from your mouth? It's just like you to start hitting me when Lan Wangji isn't around, Jin Ling hollered as he covered his head. If he were here, do you think he wouldn't help me hit you if I told him to? Ooh, Wei Wuxian said. Wei Wuxian's like, I'm a bottom and I know who has the real power in this dynamic, thank you. I'm the head of the family, Jin Ling blurted in disbelief. Wei Wuxian scoffed, smiling scornfully. I've beaten up at least 80 family heads, if not a hundred. Jin Ling leapt to his feet and made to dash out of the tea stall. Hit me again and I'll leave. Come back, Wei Wuxian yanked him by the back of his collar like he was lifting a baby chick. He gave the stool a slap. I'll stop, sit properly. Jin Ling was wary. It was only when he saw Wei Wuxian indeed showed no intent to hit him again that he very reluctantly sat down. Seeing the commotion finally draw to a close, the woman from the tea stall came over, and a hand covering her smile a hand covering her smile to refill their water. Wei Wuxian picked up the teacup and took a sip. All of a sudden he said, Ah Ling. Jin Ling shot him a glare. What? But Wei Wuxian simply smiled. You've grown a lot. Jin Ling was stunned. Wei Wuxian stroked his chin. You seem um, a lot more dependable now. I'm really happy, but I'm also... How should I put it? You were pretty adorable back when you were silly and naive. Jin Ling started fidgeting in his seat again. Out of the blue, Wei Wuxian reached out to wrap an arm around Jin Ling's shoulders and tussle his hair. But no matter what, I'm really happy to see you, you brat. Disregarding his messy hair, Jin Ling leapt up from the bench in another attempt to rush out. Wei Wuxian smacked him back down again. Where are you going? Jin Ling's neck was already red. I'm going to see the White Chamber, he answered gruffly. Didn't you already see it? Wei Wuxian asked. I am going to see it again, Jin Ling said. You've seen it several times now. I doubt a few more looks will turn up anything new. Why not help me investigate something else? Jin Ling was afraid he was going to say more sappy, cringeworthy stuff. He'd rather be slapped hard than get used to someone patting him on the head and saying nice things to him with an arm around his shoulders. Oh, sweetie, there was really no way to predict what would come out of this man's mouth, especially considering how he had even gone so far as to shout in public about wanting to bed Hang on Jun. And so Jin Ling hurriedly said, Sure, what do you want to investigate? I want to look into whether there's this strange person in the area, said Wei Wuxian. Someone with dozens of slashes on their face. Their eyelids and lips are also cut off. Jin Ling could tell that he wasn't talking nonsense. That I can do, but why do you want to investigate such a... Out of the blue, the woman refilling the water piped up. You're talking about hook hand, right? Wei Wuxian turned his head. Hook hand? Yeah. The tea lady had probably been eavesdropping for amusement. As soon as she had the opportunity, she butted in. No mouth, no eyelids. Isn't that who you're talking about? Gongji, from your accent, you don't seem to be a local. I'm surprised you actually know about him. I'm a local and I've never heard of him, Jin Ling said. That's because you're young, said the tea lady. It's no surprise you've never heard of him. But he used to be quite well known. Well known, echoed Wei Wuxian. In what way? Not in a good way, the tea lady answered. When I was a child, I heard the story from my grand aunt's mama. You can imagine just how long ago this took place. I don't know what Hook Han's real name was, but he was once a small-time blacksmith. 
Although he was poor, his workmanship was excellent, and he was pretty good-looking to boot. He was also an honest and diligent man. He had a wife who was really, really beautiful, and he was very good to her. His wife, however, was not very good to him. She took a lover outside the marriage, and then, not wanting her husband anymore, she killed him. The tea lady had obviously grown up blighted by this tale and was vivid and dramatic when inflicting it on others. Her tone and facial expressions as she narrated were on point, so much so that listening to her put Jin Ling on edge as well. The most vicious be the heart of a woman indeed, he thought. Wei Wuxian, on the other hand, dealt with fierce corpses and evil spirits for years on end. He had heard at least 800 similar stories, if not a thousand. The trope wasn't just old, it was dead and rotted. He merely propped his chin on his hand and listened expressionlessly as the tea lady continued. The wife was afraid people would recognize the corpse was her husband's, so she cut off his eyelids and slashed his face dozens of times, and then she spotted a newly forged iron hook laying nearby. Because she was afraid he would lodge a complaint against her to the judges of the underworld, she grabbed it and used it to hook his tongue and tear it from his mouth. Oh! All of a sudden, someone blurted out, How could his wife do that? I can't believe she'd kill and, and mutilate her own husband in such a depraved way. Jin Ling had been listening to the story with fascination, and the voice startled him so bad he nearly jumped out of his skin. He looked back, realizing that Lan Chijui, Lan Jingyi, and the rest had already emerged from the Bai residence. They had crowded together behind him and were listening with rapt attention. The one who'd spoken up was Lan Jingyi. Alas, said the tea lady, there's only so much we can learn from tales of the relationships between men and women. When our protagonists despise the poor and curry favor with the rich or abandon an old flame for the new lover, it's not something any bystander could ever understand. In any case, the blacksmith became a specter that looked neither human nor ghost. He was on the verge of death when his vicious wife secretly threw him into the grave mound to the west of the city. Crows loved to eat corpses and rotting meat, but they didn't even dare peck at his flesh when they saw that face of his. Lin, Lan Jingyi was easily moved and became absorbed in any story he heard. He was the perfect audience. She's too much, too much. Didn't she get her comeuppance for killing him? She did. How could she not? Said the tea lady. Although the blacksmith was horribly injured, he somehow survived. One night he crawled from his grave and returned home. While his wife was sleeping like nothing was wrong, he used the hook to, she made a gesture, slash her throat to shreds. The junior's expressions were complicated. They could feel their hair standing on end, but at the same time, they wanted to breathe a sigh of relief. After he killed his wife, he slashed her face to bits and ripped out her tongue, too, the tea lady continued. But his resentment was not appeased. From then on, he started killing any beautiful woman he came across. Lan Jingyi was stunned. The last sentence had hit him hard. That's not right. It's one thing to take revenge, but what did the other beautiful women do to him? Indeed, the tea lady replied, but he didn't really care. His face was now hideous, and every time he saw a beautiful woman, it reminded him of his wife. What could you expect him to do with all that hatred in his heart? Anyway, for a long time afterward, no young woman dared walk alone once the sky darkened. If they didn't go out, those who stayed home without a father, brother, or husband present also didn't dare sleep. And that's because every so often, a female corpse with its tongue ripped out would be found discarded on the side of the road. Didn't anyone manage to catch him? Jin Ling asked. They couldn't, the tea lady answered. After this blacksmith killed his wife, he disappeared. He abandoned his former home and appeared and disappeared mysteriously, moving so dexterously he seemed possessed. How could the average person catch him? Anyway, I heard it took several years for him to, be fi to finally be subdued. With the matter resolved, everyone was able to sleep in peace. Amitabha Buddha, thank heavens. After leaving the tea stall and returning to the mortuary, Lan Chijui said, Wei Chenbei, is the hook hand you thought to investigate related to the evil spirit at the Bai residence? Of course, Wei Wuxian answered. Jin Ling had more or less guessed this, but still asked what needed to be asked. How were they related? Wei Wuxian opened the coffin lid again. In the corpse of this burglar... The boys covered their noses. I've already examined the burglar's corpse several times, Jin Ling said. Wei Wuxian dragged him over. Evidently, you didn't look closely enough. He patted Jin Ling's shoulder and suddenly pressed down on it. The moment Jin Ling's head went down, he came face to face with that ashen-faced, 
bulging-eyed corpse in the coffin. The stench hit him head on. Look at his eyes, Wei Wuxian said. Jinling narrowed his eyes and stared at the dull, lifeless eyes of the corpse. One glance was enough to make him go cold from head to toe. Knowing there was something amiss, Lan Shijui immediately bent over for a look, too. The figure reflected in the corpse's black eyes wasn't his own. It was an unfamiliar face that almost filled the entire iris, a face missing its eyelids and lips with patchy skin covered in slashing scars. Lan Jingyi hopped a couple of times behind him, seemingly wanting to look but not daring to. Shijui, what, what did you see? Lan Shijui waved his hand. Don't come over. Oh, Lan Jingyi hurriedly took several big steps back. Lan Shijui raised his head. Speaking of which, I've heard folk tales like this. Sometimes the eyes will record what a person sees before they die. I didn't expect it to be true. It only happens occasionally, Wei Wuxian said. The burglar was scared to death. No matter what he saw, it probably made a deep and indelible impression on him. That's why it worked. Under different circumstances, nothing might have been recorded. We probably won't be able to see it anymore once the corp decays completely in a few days. Jin Ling voiced his doubt. Is this really a credible lead, since it's based on a folktale and an inconsistent one at that? Credible or not, let's investigate it before we come to a decision, said Wei Wuxian. It's better than being stuck here. At least they were making progress. Lan Shijui decided to head to the grave mound west of the city to search for clues, and Wei Wuxian declared that he would accompany him. Meanwhile, the rest of them would investigate Hook Hand. After all, it would be hard to accomplish what they'd set out to do by relying only on hearsay. The more information they could gather, the better. Jin Ling wasn't fond of Lan Jingyi, and also felt like the place Wei Wuxian was going would be more conducive to gaining experience. But when he remembered the others weren't familiar with Lan Ling and might run into issues without him to lead them, but then he remembered. So he promptly agreed, without complaint. The group agreed to rendezvous at the Bai residence in the evening. The information they obtained after making a few rounds of inquiries was essentially the same as what the tea lady had said earlier that day. Presumably, her account matched the version in wide circulation. And so, Jin Ling and the others returned to the Bai residence first. As dusk fell, Jin Ling paced back and forth in the main hall of the Bai residence. Wei Wuxian and Lan Shijui had yet to return, even after he'd gone a few rounds of bickering with Lan Jingyi. Just as he was about to head west of the city to search for them, someone suddenly slammed the main door open with a loud bang. The first one to barge through the door was Lan Shijui. He was struggling to hold on to a scalding hot object. The moment he stepped through the door, the object slipped from his grasp and fell to the ground. It was palm-sized and wrapped in layers of yellow talisman paper. Damp scarlet blood seeped through and stained the surface of the paper. Wei Wuxian followed him in, strolling leisurely across the threshold. Seeing the others crowding over excitedly, he quickly shooed them away. Spread out and stay away. Danger! Beware! And thus the crowd dispersed just as excitedly. The object seemed to be corrosive, slowly eating away the talisman paper on the surface of the bundle to reveal what was within. A rusty iron hook. It wasn't just rusty. The brightness of the blood staining it made it seem like it had just been dislodged from a hunk of human flesh. Oh. The iron hook of hook hand? Jin Ling asked. Burn marks and blood stains covered Lan Shijui's uniform. He gasped slightly for breath, his face slightly flushed as he answered, Yes, something has possessed it. Don't touch it with your bare hands. The iron hook began to shake violently. Close the door, Lan Shijui commanded. Don't let it escape. If it gets away, I don't know if I can catch it again. Lan Jingyi was the first to rush forward and slammed the main door shut with another bang. Bracing his back against the door, he yelled, Talisman! Guys, hit it with your talismans! All at once, it was slapped with hundreds of talismans. If everyone from the Bai residence hadn't already hidden themselves in the eastern courtyard at Jin Ling's behest, they would surely have been shocked by the sight of the blazing flames and sizzling lightning. The boys exhausted their supply of talismans in short order, but before they could breathe a sigh of relief, the iron hook began to bleed again. They couldn't stop for even a moment. Lan Shijui could find no more talismans in reserve. Suddenly, he heard Lan Jingyi shout, Kitchen! Into the kitchen! Salt, salt, salt! Bring the salt! At his reminder, the boys dashed into the kitchen to grab the salt jar. They hurled a handful of snowy grains to scatter all over the iron hook. 
The result was incredible. The rusty iron hook started to sizzle and splutter white foam and steam as if it was being deep fried in a wok full of oil. A wave of stench permeated the main hall, like the smell of rotten meat being charred. The fresh blood on the iron hook looked like it was gradually being absorbed by the grains of salt. One of the boys said, We're almost out of salt. What should we do next? The hook was about to bleed again. This was clearly not a long-term solution. So Lan Jing Yi said, If worse comes to worse, we'll smelt it. We can't smelt it, Jin Ling objected. But Lan Chijui said, Okay, we'll smelt it. He immediately took off his outer robe, threw it over the iron hook, rolled it up, and dashed into the kitchen to fling the whole bundle into the stove. Seeing this play out, Jin Ling's eyes blazed with fury. Lan Chijui, it's one thing for Lan Jing Yi to be silly, but why are you being silly too? You're going to try to smelt it with just that tiny bit of fire? Who are you calling silly, Lan Jing Yi fumed, and what do you mean it's one thing for me to be silly? No, no, I love them, your honor, I love them. <coughs> <coughs> Lan Chijui cut in. If there's, no, if there's not enough fire, we'll make more. He made a hand seal with his fingers and the flames instantly erupted, sending forth a wave of searing heat. Understanding immediately dawned on the others, who all followed suit. Even Jin Ling and Lan Jing Yi were too preoccupied to continue their argument as they concentrated on maintaining their hand seals. The fire underneath abruptly flared and the flames burned so red that they cast a crimson hue over their faces. They waited like that for a long time, as though they were locked in a battle against a formidable foe. Finally, the iron hook gradually disappeared into the scorching flames. Seeing nothing strange ultimately happen, Lan Jing Yi asked tensely, Is it done? Did we succeed? Lan Chijui, ex Lan Chijui exhaled. After a while, he stepped forward to check, then turned around. The iron hook is gone, he declared. With the, with the possessed object gone, the resentful energy should naturally have dispersed as well. Everyone heaved a sigh of relief, especially Lan Jing Yi, who was the happiest of all. Is anyone expecting Wei Wuxian to come bursting through the doors, being like, Where's the hook? God, I hope you didn't burn it. Right? I'm waiting for that punchline. Everyone heaved a sigh of relief, especially Lan Jing Yi, who was the happiest of all. I told you it could be smelted. It worked, you see? Although Lan Jingyi was happy, Jin Ling felt was feeling down. He hadn't been much help during the night hunt, leaving him without much gain from the experience either. Deep down, he was chagrined. He should have insisted on going with Wei Wuxian and Lan Shijui to look for Hook Hand during the daytime. He'd never do any of the grunt work again. Unexpectedly, Wei Wuxian said, You were too sloppy with your wrap-up. How can you be so confident that the matter's been settled? Don't you need to verify it? On hearing this, Jin Ling perked up. How do we verify it? Have someone spend the night in that room, said Wei Wuxian. There was silence all around. Once you've spent a night in there and can come out of it safe and sound without experiencing anything abnormal, that's when you can pat yourself on the back and guarantee that the matter has been thoroughly resolved. Right? Wei Wuxian continued. Who do you think is going to do a thing like that, wondered Lan Jing Yi. I'll do it, Jin Ling immediately chimed in. Wei Wuxian didn't even have to look at him to know what he was thinking. He patted his head and said with a smile, do your best if the chance presents itself. Don't touch my head, said Jin Ling, displeased. Haven't you heard that men's heads should not be touched? Your uncle must have been the one who told you that, said Wei Wuxian. It doesn't matter if you listen to him or not. Hey, Jin Ling was shocked. Who told me earlier to go to him if something's wrong? The Bai family had arranged for everyone's food and lodging, so the group stayed in the eastern courtyard for the evening while Jin Ling went to the western courtyard alone. The juniors of the land clan of Gusu, who still strictly followed their daily work and rest routine while on the road, woke early the next morning. Lan Shijui had been instructed by Lan Wangji to wake Wei Wuxian up for breakfast before he left, so he spent nearly an hour doing all he could to finally drag Wei Wuxian downstairs. When they arrived in the main hall, Lan Jingyi was helping the servants of the Bai residence distribute kanji. Lan Shijui was about to go over to help as well when he saw Jin Ling trudge in, with two dark circles under his eyes. The circle of people gazed at him in silence. Jin Ling sat down at Wei Wuxian's left, and Wei Wuxian greeted him. Good morning. Jin Ling nodded in reply, wearing an expression of forced calm. Good morning. The others nodded too. Good morning. Seeing that he had no intention to speak, even after some time had elapsed, Wei Wuxian pointed to his own eyes. You're looking a bit, um... After ensuring that he still looked coolly indifferent, 
Jin Ling spoke up. As expected, the wrap-up was sloppy. The crowd tensed. After Jin Ling entered the White Chamber last night, he had surveyed his surroundings. The room was extremely simple, with barely any furniture except for a dusty bed resting against the wall. Jin Ling touched it once and couldn't stand it another moment. No servant dared approach the room, and there was no way he could lie down with so much dust everywhere. Left with no other choice, he fetched water and cleaned the place up himself before managing, with some difficulty, to lie down, with his face to the wall and his back to the room and a mirror hidden in the palm of his hand. By turning the mirror, he could get a general view of the room behind him. Jin Ling had waited for over half the night. All the mirror reflected was endless darkness, so he twirled it in his hand. Just as he was about to amuse himself by doing it again, a dazzling white figure suddenly glinted across the mirror's surface. His heart had lurched. He composed himself, then slowly turned the mirror around. Something had finally appeared on its surface. Hearing this, Lan Jing Yi said in a trembling voice, What was in the mirror? Hook hand? No, said Jin Ling. It was a chair. Lan Jing Yi was about to breathe a sigh of relief when he thought on it further, and his hair instantly stood on end. How could a chair's appearance merit a sigh of relief? Jin Ling had clearly said that the room's furnishings were extremely simple, with nothing but a dusty bed against the wall. If that was the case, then where did the chair come from? The chair was close, right by my bed. Oh, now that's creepy. Creepy chair, Jin Ling said. At first it was empty, but after a while, a figure in black suddenly appeared in it. Jin Ling had wanted to get a clear look. That's... Oh, God, why is that creepy? To have the chair appear before the the whatever the technical term is for this undead specter ghost hunting thing. That's effectively creepy. Don't do that. Hello? I didn't realize I would be knocking myself that far up co uh, off course. Mm. Jin Ling had wanted to get a clear look at her. But the woman had her head lowered, and half her long hair hung loose, obscuring her face. From head to toe, the only visible part of her was a pair of snow-white hands, which were settled on the armrests. He quietly adjusted the position of the mirror, but had only just moved his wrist when the woman slowly raised her head, as if sensing something. Her face was covered in dozens of bloody slashes. Oh, so you're telling me... An empty chair appears. Then a woman is sitting there, hands on the armrests, with her head down and her head over her face, like some ring bullshit? Nope. No. No, 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 no. No. Get that fucking shit out of here. Uh-uh. No. Where's the holy water? Where's my place, for God's sakes? I'm not nervous. I don't know why. I don't know why you would say that. Wei Wuxian was not at all surprised, but the other juniors were dumbfounded by what they heard. Wait a minute, Lan Jing Yi said a bowl of kanji before Jin Ling. A female ghost? How could it be a female ghost? You couldn't have been scared so silly that you started seeing things. Jin Ling smacked him. Anyone can call me silly except for you. I couldn't get a clear look at her because of all that blood and hair, but her hairstyle and clothing were that of a young woman, so there's definitely no mistake. We were looking in the wrong direction. After a pause, he continued... There was resentful energy lingering on the iron hook, but the one haunting the white chamber is probably not hook hand. Why didn't you spend more time looking at her appearance? asked Lan Jing Yi. Who knows? We might even determine her identity based on some distinctive facial features, like a mole or a birthmark. Jin Ling huffed. You think I didn't want to? I meant to, but the female spirit noticed the moonlight reflected by the mirror and immediately looked in my direction. Ooh, fuck that. The mirror reflected her eyes, and I locked gazes with her in a momentary lapse of attention. If an evil spirit caught him spying, he couldn't possibly keep looking at them. He had to set down the mirror at once and close his eyes, pre pretending to be sound asleep. If he hadn't, it would have provoked the evil being and intensified its killing intent. What a close call, Lan Jing Yi said. Everyone at the table started speaking at once, but there was no woman in the burglar's eyes. Just because he didn't see one doesn't mean there wasn't one. Perhaps the burglar's position was off. That's not it. A female ghost? Why is it a female ghost? Who is she? The woman's face had been slashed dozens of times, said Lan Shijui. She's So she's very likely one of Hook Han's many victims. What Jin Ling saw must be a residual imprint of her resentful energy. 
A residual imprint was a constant reenactment of the point in an evil spirit's life when its resentment ran deepest. Usually, it was the moment before its death, or an event that had earned the bulk of its hatred. Hmm, Jinling made a noise of acknowledgement. The white chamber in the mirror I saw last night had completely different furnishings. It looked like an inn. There probably used to be an inn here before the Bai residence was built, and the woman was murdered there. Oh, Lan Jing Yi said. That's true. Come to think of it, when we were gathering information, someone mentioned that Hook Hand could easily pry open the lock on the inn's door. He often snuck in and eyed and targeted women who were staying there alone. And the room in which the girl or madam was killed just so happened to be in the same location as the White Chamber when the Bai residence was built, Lan Jui concluded. No wonder the master of the Bai family kept insisting there were no unsolved murders in the Bai residence and that no one had died an unnatural death. It wasn't, it wasn't that they were deliberately trying to cover up the truth, but that they were truly innocent. This really had nothing to do with them at all. Jinling picked up the kanji and drank a mouthful. I've long known that this case wouldn't be simple, he said, feigning composure. It's just as well. We have to solve it anyway. Jinling, go catch up on your sleep in a bit said Wei Wushan. We still have work to do tonight. Lan Jingyi glanced at Wei Wushan's bowl. Wei Chenbei, you didn't finish your food. Don't leave any leftovers. I'm done eating, said Wei Wushan, but you should eat some more, Jingyi. You'll be taking the lead tonight. Startled, Lan Jingyi nearly dropped the bowl he was holding. Huh? Me? Take what lead? Jin Ling didn't see everything last night, right? Wei Wushan said. This time, we'll watch to the end and find out what's going on. You take the lead. You know, I really do love Lan Jingyi. I do. I love him. The color drained from Lan Jing Yi's face. Wei Chenbei, are you sure this isn't a mistake? Why me? No mistake about it, Wei Wushan said. It's all part of gaining experience. Everyone will have an opportunity, and everyone will need to have a go at it. Shijui and Jin Ling had their turns, so you're next. Well, why me? Of course, Wei Wushan would not say outright that Lan Jing Yi's name was the only one he remembered out of this group of kids, aside from Lan Shijui and Jin Ling's. He merely patted Lan Jing Yi's shoulder encouragingly. It's a good thing. Look at the others. See how much they want to have a turn? What others? Everyone's fled! No matter how Lan Jing Yi protested, he was still shoved to the very front of the white chamber when midnight came around. A few rows of long benches had been set up outside the white chamber, currently filled with seated people. Someone poked a hole in the paper covering the window. A moment later, it was riddled with holes, presenting a wretched sight. Feels like this can no longer be called peeping, thought Lan Shijui, poking his own peephole with his finger. The way we're poking holes in it, we might as well tear down the whole window. Sure enough, Lan Jingyi was hauled by Wei Wushan into a seat at the front of the group. From his spot, he would have the most complete and clearest view. Had this been a play they were watching, it would have been a prime seat that not even money could buy. It was a pity Lan Jingyi did not want this privilege in the least. Sandwiched between Jin Ling and Lan Shijui, he asked with trepidation, Can I sit somewhere else? No, said Wei Wushan, pacing back and forth off to the side. When the others heard him, they all felt like Wei Wushan's tone bore the true essence of Lan Wang Ji's influence. Someone even snickered. Good attitude there, Wei Wushan said. So relaxed. Good, good. Lan Shijui, who couldn't help himself earlier, hurriedly schooled his expression. Look, I don't even have a seat, said Wei Wushan to Lan Jingyi, so count your blessings. Chen Bei, I can give you my seat, Lan Jingyi offered. You cannot. Then what can I do? You can ask questions. Left without a choice, Lan Jingyi could only say to Lan Shijui, Shijui, if I pass out, you, you have to let me copy your notes. Torn between laughter and tears, Lan Shijui said, All right. Lan Jingyi breathed a sigh of relief. Then I can rest assured. Don't worry, Jingyi. You'll definitely persevere, Lan Shijui encouraged him. Just as a grateful expression crossed Lan Jingyi's face, Jin Ling patted him on his shoulder, looking very dependable indeed. That's right. Don't worry. If you pass out, I'll wake you up right away. Greatly alarmed, Lan Jingyi smacked at his hand. Be gone with you! Who knows what method you use, you'd use to wake me up? Just as they were chattering amongst themselves, a blood-red light glowed from behind the paper window, as if someone had suddenly lit a crimson lamp in the pitch-dark room. <sighs> the group immediately shut up and held their breath in rapt attention. The red light seeped through the tiny holes in the windows, making each peeping eye look utterly bloodshot. Lan Jingyi raised a trembling hand. 
Chenbe, why does the room look so red? I've never seen such a blood red residual imprint. Could it be that there was a red lamp lit in the room at the time of the incident? Not a red lamp, Lance and Joey whispered. It's because the person had blood in their eyes, Jin Ling finished. Something suddenly appeared under the room's red light. It was a chair with a person sitting on it. Jin Ling, is this what you saw last night? said Wei Wuxian. Jin Ling nodded, but I didn't look carefully enough. She wasn't sitting on the chair. She was tied to the chair. Just as he said, the woman's hands were tightly bound to the armrests with hemp rope. The crowd was about to take a closer look when a black shadow suddenly flashed past, bringing the figure count in the room up to two. To think yet another person was part of this imprint. The second person's eyelids and lips were missing, so he could neither blink nor close his mouth. With his bloodshot eyeballs and bright red gums exposed, he was a thousand times more terrifying than suggested in the legend. Hookhand, Lan Jing Yi involuntarily blurted out. What's happening? Didn't we already smelt the iron hook? Why is Hookhand still here? So there are actually two evil spirits in the room? On hearing this, Wei Wuxian spoke up. Is it two? How many evil spirits are in this room precisely? Can someone clarify? One, answered Lan Chijui. One, Jin Ling said as well. The hook hand in the white chamber is not a real malicious spirit, but a residual imprint of the scene right before the woman's death, which is playing out because of her resentful energy. It may be a residual imprint, said Lan Jingyi, but it's just a creepy and but it's just as creepy and terrifying as the real thing. As they spoke, the face slowly moved toward the door. The closer it got, the clearer and more hideous it became. Even though the boys knew that this was merely a residual imprint, that they had destroyed the Iron Hook, hosting Hookhand's lingering resentment, and this phantom Im image would never really come through the door, the spine-chilling fear that they had been discovered still haunted them. If that unfortunate burglar had seen this scene when he crept into the white chamber in the middle of the night, then it was little wonder he had suffered a shock bad enough to trigger a heart attack. When that hideous face was less than 30 centimeters from the paper window, it paused for a moment, then turned around and strode toward the chair. The boys started to breathe again. Hook hand paced back and forth inside the room, and the old wooden boards creaked under his feet. However, outside, however, Jin Ling suddenly started to wonder about something. There's one thing that's been bothering me, he said. What? Lan Chijui asked. The residual imprint formed by resentful energy, energy must be showing the scene of the woman's death, no doubt about it. But would an average person be so calm when faced with such a homicidal maniac, making no sound at all? In other words, that woman was clearly conscious, so why didn't she scream for help? Scared out of her wits, perhaps? Lan Jing Yi suggested. Not to the extent she wouldn't even make a single peep, Jin Ling argued. She's not even crying. Don't women usually cry when they're extremely frightened? Does she still have her tongue? Lan Chijui asked. No blood at the corners of her mouth, so she should still have it, Jin Ling replied. And besides, it's not like she couldn't make a sound at all with no tongue, even if she couldn't speak prop speak clearly. Sandwiched between them, Lan Jing Yi looked as if he was about to die right then and there. Can you two not casually discuss such a frightening thing right in my ear? <laughs> Could this inn have been abandoned or deserted? One of the boys asked. And so she knows screaming is pointless and she might as well save her breath? Lan Jing Yi, who had the clearest look of them all, finally had something to offer. It can't be that. Look at the residual imprint. There's no dust on the furnishings, so they've clearly been in use. And it can't be deserted, or she wouldn't have stayed here. Looks like you're not that incurably stupid after all, said Jin Ling. Whether it's deserted or not is one thing, and whether she'd scream or not is quite another. If someone was hunting you down in the wilderness, fear would make you scream for help even if you knew there was no one around to save you, wouldn't it? Wei Wuxian applauded him softly. Oh my, as expected of sect leader Jin, he whispered. Jin Ling blushed and fumed. What are you doing? Don't distract me like that, okay? If you can be distracted that easily, you still need to work on your focus, said Wei Wuxian. Hurry up and look. Hook Hand seems to be making his move. The boys hurriedly turned their heads to look, only to see Hook Hand take out a bundle of hemp rope. He wound it around the woman's neck, then began to tighten it. The sound of hemp rope being tightened. So this was the source of the strange sound that the master of the Bai family had said he heard every night in the white chamber. 
The slash wounds on the woman's face bled profusely as the pressure of the rope tightened, but she still did not make a sound. The boys had their hearts in their throats at the sight, and someone couldn't help but urge in a small voice, Go on, scream! Scream for help! Contrary to their expectations, the victim didn't move, but the murderer did. Hookhand abruptly released his grip on the rope and pulled the sharpened iron hook from behind him. The boys outside were so anxious their hair stood on end. They itched to jump into the room and scream wildly on the woman's behalf. They wanted to wake the entire city with their howls. Hookhand's back, Hook back blocked their line of sight as, as he reached out with one hand. From where the boys were, they could only see the back of a hand resting on the armrest. All of a sudden, veins bulged on the back of that hand. Even at this stage, the woman still didn't make a sound. Jinlin couldn't help but wonder, is she weak in the head? What do you mean by weak in the head? Like, dim-witted. Silence descended on the room. Saying she was dim-witted sounded quite rude, but considering the situation, it really seemed the most plausible explanation. How else would a normal person still not have reacted? Watching this was making Lan Jingyi's brain hurt, so he turned his face away. Wei Wuxian, however, said, Watch carefully. Looking like he couldn't bear another moment of the scene before him, Lan Jingyi begged, Chen Bei, I, I really can't watch anymore. There are hundreds and thousands of things in the world more tragic than this, said Wei Wuxian. If you don't dare face this one directly, you can forget about the rest. Occupational hazard. Hearing that, Lan Jingyi composed himself. He gritted his teeth and turned his head to continue watching, face miserable. But none of them could have expected what happened next. The woman opened her mouth and bit down on the iron hook. You're right, I didn't have that on my bingo card. What? The bite startled the rows of boys outside and they all jumped. Inside the room, Hookhand also seemed greatly startled. He tried to retract his hand, but even as he yanked, he couldn't pull the iron hook from the vice of the woman's teeth. Instead, the woman lunged forward with the chair in tow. Somehow, the iron hook that Hookhand had intended to use to rip out her tongue had slashed open his own stomach. The boys broke out in a flurry of exclamations. They practically clung to the doorframe, desperately wishing they could stuff their eyeballs through the holes in the windows to get a closer look into the white chamber. Hookhand's injured hand was clearly in pain. He suddenly froze, as if remembering something. With his right hand, he grabbed for the woman's chest like he wanted to gouge out her heart. The woman rolled to the side to dodge the attack, chair and all, but he had grabbed the robes at her chest, and they tore with a loud ripping sound. Given the situation, the boys were too distracted to dwell on little things like indecent exposure. What made their jaws drop was that the woman's chest was flat and broad. How was this a woman? This would-be victim was a man in disguise. Hookhand pounced and seized the man's neck with his bare hands, forgetting his hook was still in the man's mouth. The man instantly jerked his head to the side and the iron hook cut into Hookhand's wrist. One man was doing all he could to break the other's neck, while the other was determined to drain the first man of blood. For a moment, both of them were locked in a stalemate. It was only when a rooster's crowing heralded the arrival of daybreak that the red light in the room disappeared and the residual imprint faded. The circle of boys outside the white chamber were completely dumbfounded by what they had just seen. It was a long time later when Lan Jingyi stammered, the, the, these, these two, everyone was thinking the same thing. In the end, it's likely neither of them survived. No one could have imagined that the evil spirit haunting and disrupting the peace of the Bai residents for decades was not Hookhand, but the hero who had eliminated Hookhand. The junior's discussion was in full swing. That was totally unexpected. To think that's how Hookhand was defeated? Come to think of it, that was the only way it could have happened, wasn't it? After all, Hookhand came and went like the wind, and no one knew where he was hiding. If he didn't disguise himself as a woman to lure Hookhand out, no one would ever have caught him. But that was so dangerous. It was indeed. Look, didn't the hero fall for his trap and end up tied to a chair? He was already at a disadvantage right from the start. Who would have wound up in such a bad situation if they had confronted each other head on? Yeah, and he couldn't even shout for help. Hookhand killed so many people. Cruelty comes naturally to him. Even if ordinary folk answered the hero's shouts, they'd be delivering themselves to their deaths. 
That's why he wouldn't try to call for help. They perished together. I can't believe there wasn't a single mention of that valiant hero's righteous deeds in the rumors. It's really puzzling. That's only to be expected. Everyone finds the legend of a homicidal maniac more interesting than that of a hero. Villains, babe. Jin Ling considered it. A departed soul that's reluctant to move on to the next life must have some unfinished business or unfulfilled wish. When the departed's corpse is incomplete, the reluctance is always because they had they have yet to find those missing pieces. That must be his true reason for haunting the Bai residence. It could be unbearable to part with a superfluous object one had carried with them for decades, let alone a piece of flesh from one's mouth. Len Jingyi listened with reverent awe. Then we must find his tongue as soon as possible and burn it in his name so he can move on to the next life. Eager to get started, they all abruptly stirred, stood. That's right, how can we let a hero like that die without a complete corpse? Let's find it. We'll start searching in the grave, grave mound west of the city. We'll do the graveyard in the entire Bai residence, as well as the house Hokan formerly lived in. Don't miss any of them. The boys were full of determination as they flowed out the door. But before leaving, Jin Ling looked back at Wei Wuxian. What's wrong? Wei Wuxian asked. Wei Wuxian had remained non-committal during their discussion, staying out of the conversation. It made Jin Ling uneasy. He wondered if they had made a mistake somewhere, but after careful consideration, felt they hadn't missed any key points. So Jin Ling answered, Nothing. Wei Wuxian smiled. Then go on with your search. Be patient. And so Jin Ling left, valiant and spirited. Oh, Wei Wuxian, letting all the baby ducklings fly out the nest. No. No. It was only days later that Jin Ling realized what Wei Wuxian had meant when he told him to be patient. <coughs> <coughs> Wei Wuxian had led Lan Shijui on the search for the Iron Hook, which had taken them a grand total of an hour to find. But Wei Wuxian did not interfere in their quest for the tongue, leaving them to search on their own for a full five days. The others were ready to collapse from exhaustion by the time Lan Jingyi sprang up, holding an object over his head. Despite having searched among the wild graves until they, until they were a wretched, unkempt, smelly sight, they were elated, for Wei Wuxian seriously told them the honest truth when he heard about their findings that successfully pleading their, completing their search in five days, using only their own abilities, was very impressive. Many cultivators would fail to find their objective in ten days, or half a month, and simply give up empty-handed. The boys were beyond excited as they huddled around the dead man's tongue. It was, said that the, it was said that objects with malevolent energy glowed green, but this tongue was so dark that it was black and jarringly hard to the touch. It was impossible to tell it was once a piece of human flesh. It emanated a hostile aura, and if not for that energy, it would have decayed long ago. After performing an exorcism, they burned the tongue. It seemed this major case had finally been closed. Now that they'd come so far and done so much, it should have been over with, no matter what. As far as night hunts went, Jin Ling was pretty satisfied with this one. Who could have imagined that his satisfaction wouldn't even last a few days? The master of the Bai family came to the Golden Carp Tower again. As it turned out, all had indeed been peaceful for two days after they burned that hero's tongue, but only for those two days. On the third night, a strange sound suddenly rang out from the Bai residence again, growing louder and louder by the day. By the fifth night, the entire Bai residence was completely unable to sleep because of the din. This time, it bore down on them with such menace that their fear was even greater than before. The strange sound was not the sound of rope being tightened or flesh being cut. It was now a human voice. According to the master of the Bai family, the voice was extremely hoarse, as if it was moving a heavy tongue that had not been in use for many years. Oh. Oh, shit. Oh, man. Although the words were indecipherable, it was clearly a man screaming in agony. After he was done screaming, 
He wept bitterly. His cries were feeble at first, but gradually grew louder, until they were almost hysterical. It was both pitiful and terrifying to hear. Even neighbors three streets away from the by residence could hear it. It made passersby, passers, yeah, passersby's, that sounds weird, hair stare on end and scared them out of their minds. Is there a fly in the shot? Somewhere? It left Jin Ling in a bind. He was too busy at the end of the year to deal with it personally, so he sent a few sect disciples to check. They reported upon their return that though the screaming was indeed very tragic, there was no other harm done. Being a public nuisance did not count. As he handed in his night hunt notes, Lan Jui recounted this matter to Lan Wangji and Wei Wushan. Wei Wushan heard him out, then took a pastry from Lan Wangji's desk and ate it. Oh, that's nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about, even with the way he's screaming? Lan Chijui said there is! <laughs> By all logic, the deceased soul should have been delivered once its obsession was dealt with. It's true that a soul can be delivered once its obsession is resolved, Wei Wushan said, but did it ever occur to all of you that the real hero, that the hero's real obsession might not be to retrieve his tongue and be reincarnated? Lan Jingyi had finally got a Jia grade and was so happy he was inwardly shedding tears at the thought that he wouldn't have to copy passages as punishment this time. He couldn't help but wonder aloud, then what could it be? Don't tell me it's to howl every night so others can't sleep. Unexpectedly, Wei Wuxian nodded. That's exactly it. Lan Chijui was astonished. Wei Chenbei, Wei Chenbei, what's the explanation for this? Didn't you figure out earlier that this valiant hero didn't want to endanger the lives of innocent bystanders, and therefore did his best to endure Hook Hand's torture, refusing to scream, Wei Wuxian said? That's right, said Lan Chijui, sitting upright. What's wrong with that? Nothing wrong with it, but let me ask you a question, Wei Wuxian said. If a homicidal maniac waves a knife at you, bleeds you dry, slashes your face, wrings your neck, and rips out your tongue, wouldn't that be scary? Wouldn't you be afraid? What would you want to cry out? Lan Jingyi thought for a moment, and his face paled. Help! Lan Shijui, on the other hand, said in all seriousness, the family precepts state that even in the face of danger... Sujui, don't try that with me, Wei Wushan said. I'm asking if you would be afraid. Give it to me straight. Lan Shijui's face reddened, and his back straightened even more. I would not... Would not? Wei Wuxian repeated. Lan Chijui looked entirely honest as he cleared his throat and continued, Would not be able to say, I would not be afraid. Having said that, he cast an apprehensive glance at Lan Wangji. Wei Wuxian was highly amused. What are you ashamed of? People feel fear in the face of pain and terror. They want someone to save them, and they want to scream and shout and cry and make a scene. Isn't that only human? Am I right? Heng Wanjun, look at your clan's Lan Chijui. He's sneaking peeks at you. Say yes, quick. Once you say yes, it means you agree with me and you won't punish him. He gently elbowed Lan Wangji in the stomach, who sat prim and proper as he wrote comments on the junior's notes. Yes, said Lan Wangji without batting an eye. One line in this entire story. And it's this, his moment. Having said that, he wrapped an arm around Wei Wuxian's waist, locking him in place so that he couldn't move as he pleased, and continued to look over the notes that had been submitted. Lance Jury blushed even harder. Ooh, me too. Unable to free himself after two attempts, Wei Wuxian maintained this posture and continued, with a totally straight face, I'm assuming. Since he resisted the urge to scream, he truly had a hero's backbone, but it's also true that doing so goes against human nature and instinct. Lan Shijui tried his best to ignore the way they were positioned. After giving it some thought, his heart went out to that hero. Is Jin Ling still bothered by this? Wei Wuxian asked. Yeah, Lan Jingyi said. Little Miss, um, Jin Gongji doesn't know what went wrong either. Since that's the case, Lan Shijui said, how should we handle an evil spirit such as this? Lan let him scream, Wei Wuxian said. Silence descended for a moment. Just let him scream, Lan Jui repeated. That's right, Wei Wuxian confirmed. Once he's done screaming, he'll naturally leave. 
The other half of Lance Jui's heart went out to the entirety of the Bai residence. Fortunately, despite the hero's pent-up grievances, he had no intent to harm others. The strange sounds from the White Chamber persisted for several months before they gradually subsided. Presumably, the hero had finally had his fill of all the screams he had been unable to vent when he was alive. Content at last, he left to be reincarnated. Pitiful were the people of the Bai residence, however, who tossed and turned in agony for many long, sleepless nights. Once again, the White Chamber's reputation spread far and wide. And that is the end of that. Ooh, another little ghost-busting moment. Yeah. Ooh. All right, we're headed towards, I think, just grazing over the pages, not picking up any, any spoilers at all. I think we're aiming for page 383. So we are now on page 365 for the sixth side story called Lotus Seeds. I'm still emotionally afraid. They're going to give me feelings. I know they are. I know this woman. She is going to hurt me. She's going to hurt my feelings. We may not get the whole, the full brunt of it because I think we can only read about, I think we can only get about halfway through, um, even though it's kind of short. But, uh, okay, 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 one quick second, let me check on a thing, sweet, well, actually, it's only been an hour, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see how it goes, we'll see how far we can get, all right, <sighs> one, one more little moment to let that pass. I love the ducklings. I love Lan Jing Yi. I usually have a soft spot for the cowardly ones. The ones who are a little bit more easily shaken and like vulnerable. Just as much as I love, you know, the heroic characters, right? But there's just something so great about a scaredy cat. Something so relatable. And he's just, he's so precious. But he's also out there doing the damn thing. So like... Hello, kudos to him. Give this boy some credit. And now, uh, uh, lotus seeds, lotus seeds, lotus seeds, lotus seeds. Leave it to MXTX to condition me to have an emotional response to just the fucking lotus seed. Anyway, we're fine. It's okay. Outside Lotus Pier's sword hall, the cicadas chirped noisily in the young Hmong summer air. Inside, bodies were strewn across the ground. <sighs> Why do we let her do this? Why do we let her outside? Why do we let her just write things? Who gave this woman a typewriter? A typewriter. I'm from 1885. Why do we give this woman a laptop? Why we just allow her? We give her these things. <sighs> Inside, bodies were strewn across the ground, presenting quite the ugly sight. A dozen or so bare-chested boys were glued to the hall's wooden floorboards, occasionally turning over like sizzling pancakes emitting dying moans. It's hot. It's so hot. Wei Wuxian squinted his eyes. If only it was as cool here as it is in cloud recesses, he vaguely thought. The wooden floorboards under him had absorbed his body heat, so he turned over. Coincidentally, Jang Chung turned over too, and they brushed against each other, arm on leg. You know what I'm even more fucking angry about? That she planted that terrible fucking visual and punked us faked us out entirely in just like a couple sentences i hate this woman jeng chung move your arm away said wei wuxian at once you feel like hot coal move your leg away jeng chung retorted 
Arms are lighter than legs, said Wei Wuxian. Takes more effort to move my leg. Move your arm instead. And now Jang Chung was pissed off. Wei Wuxian, I'm warning you. Don't go too far. Shut up and don't say a word. The more you talk, the hotter it gets. Ho oh, ho! That's good. Woo! One point, Jang Chung. Can you guys stop fighting? Lu Shidia said. I feel hot just listening to you. I'm sweating even harder now. Blows and kicks were already being traded between them. Get lost. You get lost. No, 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 no. Please, you get lost. No need to be so polite. You first. Cries of complaint rose from the various shitty. Go outside if you guys want to fight. Can both of you get lost together? Please, I'm begging you. Heard that, Wei Wushan piped. Everyone's telling you to get out. You let go of my leg. It's going to break, man. The veins on Jang Chung's forehead bulged. They were clearly telling you to get out. Let go of my arm first. Suddenly, they heard the rustling of skirts on the wooden walkway outside. Both of them parted in a flash. Soon after, the, the bamboo blind lifted. I'm fine. It's okay. It is a name on a page it is some ink on a tree okay i'm fine <sighs> jang yan lee poked her head in to take a peek oh so this is where you've all been hiding everyone greeted her shi hi shi some of the more bashful disciples couldn't help but cover their chests with their arms. They slunk away to hide in the corner. Why are you lazing around today instead of training with your swords? Jang Yan Lee wondered. The weather's sweltering and it's unbearably hot at the training ground, groused Wei Wushan. We'd burn off a whole layer of skin if we tried to train. Shi Jie, please don't tell anyone. Jang Yan Lee looked between them and Jang Chung for a moment. Did you two fight again? No, Wei Wushan answered. <sighs> Jiang Yanli made her way inside, carrying a loaded tray. Then whose footprint is it on Ah Chung's chest? Hearing that he had left evidence of his crime, Wei Wushan hurriedly turned to look. Sure enough, there it was. But no one cared if the two of them had been fighting or not, for Jiang Yanli was carrying a huge tray of sliced watermelons. Yeah, mm -mm, no, mm. ooh, watermelon sounds good. Mm. The boys swarmed over, divvied up the slices in no time, and sat facing each other on the ground to munch on them. Not long after, a small mountain of watermelon rinds piled on the tray. Wei Wuxian and Jing Chung always had to compete in everything they did, and eating watermelons was no exception. They attempted to seize each other's melons by force, trading a never-ending stream of underhanded blows that the others, unable to dodge in time, scrambled away from, clearing out an open space for them. At first, Wei Wuxian spared no effort in devouring his watermelon, but as he ate, he suddenly burst into laughter. Jang Chung eyed him warily. What are you scheming now? Wei Wuxian took another slice. Nah, don't misunderstand. I'm not scheming anything. I just thought of someone. Who? asked Jang Chung. Lan Jen, answered Wei Wuxian. This flashback into still oblivious times. Why are you thinking of him out of the blue? asked Jang Chung. Don't tell me you missed those transcription punishments. Wei Wuxian sped out the seeds. Just thinking about how funny he is, that's all. You have no idea how interest. Ooh, no, this is nice. You have no idea how interesting he can be. One time I told him, your, family your family's food tastes so bad, I'd rather eat fried watermelon rind. If you have time, come have fun at Lotus Pier. He had yet to finish talking when Jang Chung smacked his watermelon askew. Are you nuts? Did you invite him to Lotus Pier to torture yourself? What are you getting antsy for? My watermelon nearly went flying, Wei Wuxian said. I was just saying it. Of course he's not going to come. Have you ever heard of him going out just to have fun? Let me make it clear, said Jang Chung sternly. I refuse to allow him to visit us. Don't invite people as you please. I didn't realize you disliked him that much, said Wei Wuxian. I have nothing against Lan Wangji, said Jang Chung, but if he visits and my mom starts comparing her children to a guy like that, you can forget about having it easy either. 
It's fine. There's nothing to be scared of. Even if he visits. Oh, please visit. Please, 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 please. I got so hopeful I lost my spot. <clears throat> if he really does, tell Jang Shushu to have him sleep with me. I guarantee I'll be able to drive him bonkers in less than a month. Less than less than a week, less than three days. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? you underestimate yourself? Wait, we should. Jang Chung scoffed. You want to bunk with him for a month? If you ask me, he'll stab you to death in less than seven days. Thank you, Jang Chung. Wei Wushan thought otherwise. I'm not scared of him. If we really came to blows, he might not be a match for me. The others cheered him approvingly. While Jang Chung cheered at him for being thick-skinned, he knew deep down, well, while Jang Chung jeered at him uh, for being thick-skinned, he knew deep down that Wei Wushan spoke the truth. He wasn't just tooting his own horn. And because that's the frustrating thing about young Wei Wushan, right? Is that he was cocky as hell, but then he had the talent to back it up. And some people call that infuriating, and I just call that attractive. It's fine. Um, but um, Zheng Yanli sat down between them. Who are you talking? Who are you two talking about? She asked. A friend you made at Gusu? Yeah, Wei Wushan answered happily. You have the cheek to call yourself his friend, Zhang Cheng said. Ask Lan Wangji about that. See if he's willing to accept you as one. Uh, screw off. If he doesn't, I'll just pester him. We'll see if he caves. Turning to Zhang Yang Li, Wei Wuxian asked, Shijie, do you know Lan Wangji? Yes, Zhang Yang Li said. He's the second young master of the Lan clan, the one everyone says is very handsome and capable, right? Is he really very handsome? Very, Wei Wuxian gushed. Compared to you, Zhang Yang Li probed. Wei Wuxian thought for a moment, perhaps just a tiny bit more handsome than me. For Wei Wuxian, that's a high compliment. He held two of his fingers a tiny distance apart to demonstrate. As Zhang Yanli collected the plates, she smiled. Then he must be really very handsome. It's a good thing to make new friends. You guys can drop in on each other to have some fun in the future when you have nothing to do. Zheng Cheng spat out his watermelon on hearing that. <laughs> Wei Wuxian waved dismissively. Forget it, forget it. The food's bad and they have so many rules. I'm not going there again. Then you can bring him over instead, said Zhang Yanli. This is a good opportunity. Why don't you invite your friend to stay at Lotus Pier for a while? Aji, don't you listen to his nonsense, Jang Cheng piped up. No one likes him at Gusu. Lan Wangji would never be willing to come with him. What are you talking about, Wei Wuxian shot back? He would. Wake up, said Jang Cheng. Lan Wangji told you to get lost, didn't you hear? Remember? What do you know? Even though he told me to get lost, I know deep down he must want to come play with me at Young Meng. And he wants it badly. Possibly my favorite, favorite flavor of dramatic irony. I ask myself the same question every day. Where in the world did all your self-confidence come from? Jang Chung asked. Stop thinking about it, Wei Wuxian said. If I'd been asking the same question for so many years without getting an answer, I'd have given up long ago. <laughs> Jang Chung shook his head. Just as he was about to fling his watermelon, he suddenly heard swift, fierce footsteps approaching and a woman's frosty voice. Oh, no. I wondered where everyone disappeared to, just as I expected. The boys' expressions changed dramatically. They dashed through the blinds just in time to run into Madame Yu as she turned the corner of the long corridor. Her purple robes fluttered as she bore down on them with truly terrifying murderous intent in her eyes. Madame Yu's face contorted at the unbecoming sight the group of bare-chested, barefooted boys presented. Her slender eyebrows raised so high they almost flew off her face. Shit, everyone thought. Frightened out of their wits, they took to their heels and ran. Seeing this, Madame Yu finally reacted. Jang Chung, she raged. 
Put your clothes on right now. Look at yourself, naked as a barbarian. If others were to see you, how could I ever show myself again? Jang Chung's clothes were tied around his waist. Hearing his mother's scolding, he hastily fumbled to put them on. Madame Yu continued with her scolding. You boys, can't you see Ali is here? Who taught you brats to ship like this in front of a girl? Of course, there was no question at all about who had taken the lead. So Madame Yu's next sentence was, most predictably, Wei Ying, seems to me like you have a death wish. Sorry, said Wei Wuxian loudly. I didn't know Shiji would come. I'll go look for my clothes right now. Madame Yu was even more incensed. You dare run from me? Get the hell back here and kneel. As she spoke, she cracked her whip. A searing pain spread down Wei Wuxian's back. I refuse to believe he actually said something like Yowch out loud, but there was an exclamation of pain, obviously. The pain was so intense it almost sent him rolling on the ground. Just then, Madame Yu heard a soft voice ask, Mom, do you want some watermelon? Jiang Yunli's sudden appearance startled Madame Yu. With this delay, the group of little brats had vanished without a trace. Madame Yu was so infuriated she turned to pinch Jiang Yunli's cheeks. Eat, eat, eat. That's all you know. Ooh, no. No, no, no. No, no. No, no, no. No, no. No. We're not fucking doing that. We're not coming after Jiang Yunli. I already have enough issues with this woman, okay? I, I've already got enough problems, enough thoughts, enough essays. We don't come after J mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. No, 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 no. <coughs> the pinch made Jiang Yunli's eyes water. Vaguely, she said, Mom, Ashian and the rest were hiding here to cool off. I came looking for them on my own, so don't blame them. Do, do you want some watermelons? I don't know who sent them over, but they're very sweet. Eating watermelon in summer can relieve the heat and quench your fire. They're sweet and juicy. I'll, I'll slice some for you. The more Madden you stewed on it, the more infuriated she became, and actually did want to eat some watermelon as the summer heat had made her thirsty. It only made her angrier. Meanwhile, the group of boys had finally managed to flee from Lotus Pier, dashing toward the docks and leaping onto a small boat. Only after some time had passed, with no sign of pursuit, did Wei Wuxian finally relax. He tried to push himself, paddling twice with the oar, but his back still hurt. He threw the oar to the others and sat down to touch the stinging flesh. This is clearly an injustice. Let's be reasonable here. Obviously no one was wearing clothes, so I scolded hit me and only me. Must be because you were the biggest eyesore with no clothes on, Jang Chung quipped. Wei Wuxian threw him a look. All of a sudden, he dove into the water. The others all entered the water as well, as if responding to his call. In no time at all, only Jang Chung was left on the boat. I think that's that's how everyone wound up with, with their shirts off, actually. Jang Chung sensed something amiss. What the heck are you doing? Wei Wuxian slid over to the side of the boat and smacked it hard with his palm. The entire boat overturned and bobbed heavily in the water with its belly up. Wei Wuxian laughed out loud, hopped onto the bottom of the boat, and sat on it with his legs crossed. He shouted at the spot where Jang Chung had fallen. I still sore? Jang Chung, answer me. Hey, hello. No one responded even after he had shouted a few times. Only a string of gurgling bubbles broke through the water's surface. Wei Wuxian wiped his face and wondered, why is he taking so long to come up? Lu Shidi swam over and blurted out in shock. He couldn't have drowned, could he? How is that possible? asked Wei Wuxian. He was just about to dive in to give Jiang Cheng a hand when he suddenly heard a loud howl behind him. He shouted in surprise as someone pushed him into the water from behind. The boat turned back upright. Apparently Jiang Cheng had remained underwater after he was thrown off the boat and circled up behind Wei Wuxian. Having each succeeded in their surprise attacks, both boys began to circle the boat vigilantly. The others splashed around in the water and spread out in the lake to watch the show. What do you think you're doing grabbing a weapon? Wei Wuxian called out across the boat. Put down the oar if you're worth your salt. We'll fight with our bare fists. Do you think I'm a fool? Asked Jing Chung with a sardonic smile. The moment I let go, you'll grab it. He swung the oar like the wind, or like the wind, forcing Wei Wuxian to back off repeatedly. The various Shidi cheered him on. Wei Wuxian had to find some breathing space from this distraction in order to defend himself. Am I that shameless? Jeers erupted all around him. Dashi Xiang, you've got some nerve. What ensued was a truly chaotic water fight. Disciples pulled out all their special moves, from the merciful club to the venomous grass to the life-taking water-spouting arrow. Wei Wuxian threw a kick at Jiang Chung and finally sprawled across the boat. 
He spat out a mouthful of lake water and raised his hand. Enough! Cease fire! Everyone wore lush clumps of water weeds on their heads, and they were having an absolute blast fighting. Why? They asked immediately. Begging for mercy now that you're at a disadvantage? Who said I'm begging for mercy? Wei Wuxian retorted. We'll fight later. I'm just too hungry to fight now. Let's grab a bite to eat. Then are we going back? Asked Liu Shidi. We can eat a few more watermelons before dinner. Go back now and there'll be nothing for you other than a lashing, said Jing Chung. But Wei Wuxian already had an idea. We're not going back, he announced. We're going to pick lotus seed pods. You mean steel, Jing Chung mocked. It's not like we don't pay up every time, said Wei Wuxian. The Jang Chung, the Jang Chung, the Jang clan of Young Meng took care of the nearby households in the area and eliminated water ghosts without asking for compensation. People for dozens of kilometers around were more than happy to partition out a portion of their lakes to plant lotus seed pods for them to consume and were unlikely to quibble over a stolen few. Every time the boys went out to eat someone else's melons, catch someone else's chickens, or drugs, drug someone else's dog, Jang Fengmian would send someone to compensate them after the fact. As for why they insisted on stealing food, it wasn't because they were hoodlums, but because they were simply boys with playful hearts who wanted the thrill of being laughed at and cursed at, being chased and beaten up. The boys got on the boat and rowed for a while before arriving at a lotus lake. It was a large lotus lake, green and verdant. Emerald leaves overlapped one another, the smallest the size of plates and the biggest as large as umbrellas. The ones at the periphery were lower and sparser as they spread out flat across the water's surface, while the other ones further in were, t were taller and crowded together, enough to hide the boats ferrying people. But one only needed to see a cluster of lotus leaves rustling shoulder to shoulder to know that someone was up to something inside. The little boat from Lotus Pier glided through the lush, verdant world. They were surrounded by large and plump hanging seed pods. One person punted the boat, while the others began grabbing the seed pods. The big-headed pods grew on tall and slender stems, riddled with tiny, harmless thorns. The smooth green shafts broke easily with just a snap. The boys broke off the seed pods along with a long section of the stem, which would allow them to stick, to stick them in a vase of water upon their return. It was said doing that would keep the seed pods fresh and tender for a few more days, or so Wei Wuxian had heard at any rate. He didn't know if it was true or not, but he relayed the fact to others in all seriousness. He broke off a few and peeled one that was full of seeds. He popped them into his mouth, finding them tender and juicy. As he ate, he hummed offhandedly, I'll treat you to lotus seed pods. What will you treat me to? Jang Chung heard him. Who are you treating? Oh, not you in any case, Wei Wuxian answered. He was about to pluck a lotus seed pod to throw at his face, but then suddenly hushed everyone around him instead. Oh, shoot, the old man is here today. The old man was the farmer who had planted the lotuses in this stretch of water. As for how old he actually was, Wei Wuxian had no idea. Jiang Fengmian was shu shu to him, at any rate, and anyone older than Jiang Fengmian surely must be an old man. This man had worked... This man had worked this lotus lake for as long as Wei Wuxian could remember, and he would hit them if he caught them when they came to steal lotus seed pods in the summer. Wei Wuxian often suspected that this old man was the reincarnation of a lotus spirit, because he knew the seed pods in his lake like the back of his hand, and always knew exactly how many were missing. The number stolen would be exactly how many times he would hit them in retribution. After all, bamboo punt poles were easier to use than oars when getting around the lotus lake by boat. Each blow, each blow to the body hurt like hell. All the boys had taken a few beatings from him before. Run, run, they hissed in hushed, hushed tones. They quickly grabbed the oars and fled, rowing out of the lotus lake, lotus, lake in a, lotus lake in a flurry. Their guilty consciences made them glance back. The old man's boat had already made its way out of the layers and layers of lotus leaves and was gliding in open water. Wei Wuxian cocked his head and squinted. Weird, he blurted out. Jang Chung stood up, too. Why is that boat going so fast? All the boys looked. The old man had his back to them, counting the lotus seed pods on the boat one at a time. The bamboo punt pole had been set off to the side and wasn't moving, but the boat still moved steadily and swiftly, so much so that it was even faster than their own. Everyone was on guard. Row back over, row back over, Wei Wuxian prompted. What, once the boats drifted close, the boys could make out a faint white shadow wandering under the water next to the old man's boat. 
Wei Wuxian looked back and pressed an index finger against his lips, signaling for the others to be cautious and not alarm the old man or the water ghost beneath him. Zheng Cheng nodded. He rode with soundless movements, leaving waves of silent ripples in his wake. When the two boats were about ten meters apart, an ashen, dripping wet hand rose out of the water and stealthily grabbed one of the lotus seed pods from the heap on the old man's boat before retreating soundlessly below the lake. After a moment, two lotus seed pod shells floated to the water's surface. The boys were struck dumb by the sight. Oh wow, even the water ghost steals lotus seed pods! The old man finally noticed someone behind him. With one hand holding a large lotus seed pod, he grabbed the bamboo punt pole with his other hand and spun around. This movement startled the water ghost, and with a slithering sound, the white figure vanished without a trace. Where do you think you're running? the boys hurriedly cried. Wei Wuxian lunged into the water and dove beneath the surface. In no time, he dragged something back up. Caught it! He lifted a water ghost in his hand. Its skin was pale, and it looked like it was once a child of about twelve or thirteen. It was so terrified, it almost shrank into a ball under the boy's gaze. The old man swung the pole at them and shouted, Here to mess around again, you bratty little ghouls! Wei Wuxian's back, which had just received a lashing, took another strike. He yelped in pain and almost lost his grip. Zhang Chung fumed, Be nice to us! Why lash out at us? You're mistaking our good will for ill intent! It's fine, it's fine, Wei Wuxian said hurriedly. Old ma- um, uncle? Please take a good look. We're not ghouls. This is the ghoul. Obviously, the old man said. I'm old, not blind. Let it go. Wei Wuxian was stupefied. But then, he saw the little water ghost he had caught was repeatedly bowing to him with tearful eyes. It was quite the pitiful sight. The ghost was still grasping the large lotus seed pot it had stolen earlier, loath to part with it. The seed pot had been pried open. It seemed like it had only managed to eat a couple of seeds before Wei Wuxian hauled it out. Finding the old man unreasonable, Zheng Cheng said to Wei Wuxian, Don't let it go. We'll bring it back with us. Hearing this, the old man lifted his bamboo punt pole again. Don't! Don't hit me! I'll put it down, said Wei Wuxian quickly. Don't let it go, said Zheng Cheng. What if it kills someone else? It doesn't stink of blood, said Wei Wuxian. It's too young to leave this stretch of water, and there hasn't been news of any deaths in this area. It probably hasn't harmed anyone. Zheng Cheng continued to argue. Even if it hasn't yet, that doesn't mean it won't in the future. He hadn't so much as finished his sentence when the bamboo punt pole came down on him. Jang Chung bristled at the blow. Can't you tell good from bad, old man? Aren't you afraid it will harm you, knowing that it's a ghost? Why would someone with one foot in the grave be afraid of a ghost? The old man answered with self-righteous confidence. It's not like it can run very far, Wei Wuxian reasoned. Stop hitting me. I'm letting go now, he said. And then he really did let it go. The water ghost leapt behind the old man's boat as if afraid to come out again. Wei Wuxian climbed under their boat, soaking wet. The old man picked a lotus seed pod from his boat and tossed it into the water, which the water ghost ignored. The old man then selected a larger one and tossed it into the water, where it bobbed on the surface for a time. All at once, half a pale head peeked out. Like a giant white fish, the water ghost dragged the two green lotus seed pods underwater with its mouth. A moment later, a splotch of white materialized on the water's surface. Exposing its shoulders and hands, the water ghost shrank back behind the boat and lowered its head to crunch noisily on its catch. As it ate with gusto, the boys watched, puzzled. Seeing the old man toss another lotus seed pond into the water, Wei Wuxian stroked his chin. Feeling a little hard done by, he asked, Uncle, why is it that you let it steal your lotus seed pods and even give it more to eat, but when we do it, we just get smacked? It helps me propel the boat. It helps me propel the boat. So what's wrong with giving it a few lotus seed pods to eat? asked the old man. You little ghouls, though. How many did you steal today? The boys felt embarrassed. Wei Wuxian glanced out the corner of his eye at the pile of lotus seed pods in the middle of the boat. Sensing things did not bode well for them, he hurriedly called out, Let's go! The boys immediately grabbed their oars. The old man brandished his bamboo punt pole as he came charging towards them, his boat fast as the wind. The boys felt the chill run down their spines, as if that pole would come down on them any minute. They pumped their limbs and paddled like crazy. The two boats made two full laps around the lake. The distance between them was closing, and Wei Wuxian had already taken a few hits. Realizing that the pole was only aiming for him, he covered his head. That's unfair, he yelled. Why are you only hitting me? Why are you only hitting me again? Shishang, hang in there, the group of Shidi called out. We're all counting on you. Zheng Cheng, too, piped up. Yeah, hang in there. Wei Wuxian fumed. I can't take it anymore. He grabbed a lotus seed pod stuck from the boat and tossed it out. Catch. 
It was quite a big seed pod landing in the lake with a splash. Sure enough, the old man's boat stalled for a moment as the water ghost merrily swam over to fish up the seed pod to eat. Seizing their opportunity, the boat from the Lotus Pier took the, oppor took the opportunity to beat a quick retreat. Dashishan, can ghosts taste things? asked one Shidi while they made their way back. Typically not, I guess, said Wei Wushan, but I think that little ghost probably... Oh, he sneezed. The sun had set and a breeze had rolled in, bringing a break from the heat. With it, the air had grown chilly. Wei Wushan sneezed and rubbed his face. It probably didn't get to eat lotus, pod, lotus seed pods while it was alive. When it snuck in to steal them, it fell into the lake and drowned. So, uh... So by eating lotus seed pods, it's fulfilling its wish, said Zheng Chung. It gets a sense of satisfaction from it. Uh, yeah, Wei Wushan said. He felt his back, which was lined with old and new welts. He couldn't help but ask the question he'd been dwelling on. Really, this must be the greatest injustice in all of history. Why am I always the only one getting hit whenever something happens? You're the most handsome, said one of the Shidi. Your cultivation is the highest, offered another. And yet another piped up. You look the best without clothes on. The boys all nodded. Thank you for the praise, said Wei Wushan. I'm getting goosebumps. You're welcome, Dashi Shang, said the Ashidi said. You stand before us to shield us every time. You deserve even more. Oh, there's more? Wei Wushan asked in astonishment. Let's hear it. Zheng Chung couldn't stand it anymore. All of you, shut up. Talk sense or I'll stab through the bottom of the boat and we can all die together. <laughs> they were passing through a stretch of water with farmland on both sides and several petite farm girls working the fields. Seeing their little boat passing through, the girls ran to the edge of the water and greeted them from afar. Hey! The boys hayed in response and nudged Wei Wushan. Shishang, they're calling you. Wei Wushan looked over. Sure enough, these were girls he'd introduced them to before. The gloom in his heart cleared immediately, and he stood up to waving greeting. What's up? He called out with a grin. The little boat drifted with the current, and the farm girls followed along on the riverbank, chatting as they walked. Did you all go stealing lotus seed pods again? Quick, tell us how many blows you took. Or did you go drugging someone else's dog again? After the first few remarks, Zheng Cheng longed to kick Wei Wushan off the boat. That notoriety of yours really is a disgrace to our family, he said bitterly. They said you all, said Wei Wushan in his defense. We're a gang, okay? If I'm a disgrace, then we're disgraces together. The two were still bickering when one farm girl yelled out, Was it tasty? Wei Wushan took a moment to shout back, What? The watermelon we brought, said the farm girl. Was it tasty? Understanding dawned on Wei Wushan. So you were the ones who brought the watermelon. It was tasty. Why didn't you come in to sit with us? We could have treated you to tea. The farm girl smiled sweetly. You weren't all around when we bought it. When we brought it, so we left it and went on our way. We wouldn't dare come in. Glad you liked it. Thank you, Wei Wushan said as he fished several large seed pods from the bottom of the boat. I'll treat you girls to lotus seed pods. Next time, come inside and watch me train with my sword. Zheng Chung scoffed. What's there to watch about you training? Wei Wushan tossed the seed pods to the riverbank. It was quite the distance, but they landed lightly in the girls' hands. He grabbed a few seed pods and shoved them into Zheng Chung's arms. What are you standing there blankly for? Hurry up. Zheng Chung had no choice but to take the pods after two shoves. Hurry up and what? You ate the watermelon too, Wei Wushan said, so you have to go give them a gift in return. Come on, don't be shy. Start throwing. Go on. Zheng Chung snorted. What a choke. What's there to be shy about? But for all his bluster, he didn't move, not even when the entire boat full of Shidi began throwing seed pods with gusto. Then throw them, Wei Wushan said again. Throw them now, and you can ask them if the pods are tasty next time. It's an excuse to talk to them again. The Shidi were now enlightened. So that's your method. What an eye-opener. Shishang is really an old hand at this. You can tell he does this all the time. Oh, you think too highly of me. Zheng Chung snapped to his senses upon hearing this. He'd been about to throw the pods, too, but finding it deeply embarrassing now, he peeled one open instead and started eating it himself. The boat glided through the water, and the girls trotted after it along the bank, catching the verdant lotus seed pods that the boys on the boat threw to them, laughing as they ran. Wei Wushan held his hand to his brow and gazed at the sight as they went, smiling. Then suddenly he sighed. What's wrong? Dashi Shang. The boys all wondered aloud. God, he really did have groupies. You're sighing, even with all these chicks chasing after you? 
Wei Wuxian hoisted the oar over his shoulder and chuckled. It's nothing. I just thought about how I so sincerely invited Lan Zhen to Young Meng, but he actually had the nerve to turn me down. No one will be more oblivious. Just no one. Just no one. No one. Wow, as expected of Lan Wangji, the various Shidi gave a thumbs up. Shut up, Wei Wuxian said in high spirits nonetheless. One of these days, I'll drag him here and kick him off the boat. I'll trick him into stealing lotus seed pods so that the old man will wrap him with the bamboo pole and make him run after me. After hooting with laughter for a while, he looked back at Zheng Chung, who was eating lotus seeds with a straight face. His smile gradually faded and he sighed. Truly an unteachable child. Zheng Chung raged. So what if I just want to eat them myself? Oh, you, Wei Wuxian sighed. Never mind, you're beyond hope, Zheng Chung. Enjoy eating them alone for the rest of your life. Nevertheless, the little boat that had endeavored to steal lotus seed pods had, once again, returned with a full load. Well, shit, we got here a little bit early. But this is exactly where we needed to land in order to finish tomorrow or when i film tomorrow um so that is it for today that was a scene break um we're in the middle of page 383 and i think we're right smack dead in the middle of this of this one um maybe a little bit towards the end uh but yeah so we will be finishing this whole thing in the next session I am so sorry you won't get that next session until Monday instead of Friday. But uh, dates, times, arranging, publishing videos, ADD, blah, 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 you know. Um, but oh man, you got some great ghost busting with the ducklings. And now we have Lotus Pier shenanigans that just delightful. Just delightful. Just so fun. All right. So I will see you guys next time and one last time for Moda Zuche. Ooh, we're not going there yet. But until then, please remember to take care of yourself.